In this episode, we're going to dive into six parenting styles and how they're going to impact a child's mental health as well as their relationships going into adulthood. So we're covering attachment theory. That's it, baby. We're getting into <laughs> attachment theory. And uh, yes, what you do at home does indeed matter. Let's go ahead and welcome everyone. If you're not familiar, welcome to 12-Week Relationships. This is your place for better relationships in weeks, not years. My name is Pi. I'm an educator and a frameworks guy. I'm Dr. Glenn. I'm a society psychologist and professor. He's our legitimacy. Well, I guess so, man. You know what? Why don't we jump straight into this one and talk about uh, what is attachment theory and, and where does it come from? So it comes from John Bowlby. And basically, he did studies on kids, how the kids are parented. And he did this huge study on foster kids. And basically, he you know basically looked at how they were raised. And then when they became adults 18 years later or 20 years later, he was able to predict how they would behave as adults in adult relationships. So that correlation to how you were raised will dictate how you behave in adult relationships later on in life. Yeah. Which is interesting because attachment theory is very accurate from all of our clinical experience, and yet it's still a theory. What is it going to take to make it attachment law? Well, I mean, it's based off a of psychoanalysis. So, like Freud, I know. you know, his whole concept is that the past dictates the future. So, attachment comes from that that premise. It'll always be a theory. Yeah, even and, though and, it, and they've it, done studies on it, like Mary Ainsworth. Yeah, uh, the famous stranger experiment where you like have the the mother and the kid. Then the straight, and then the mother leaves. The stranger comes. We got to talk about this one because this one's like a kind of a cold study that Mary Haynes was put together. Yeah. But basically, she has the child and mother in a room. Takes the introduces a stranger, takes the mother away. Mother away. <laughs> watches how the, the kid interacts with the stranger. Yeah. Then the the stranger leaves, and the mother comes back. And then based off of those two interactions, like the basically the three interactions that take place, they're able to predict what attachment style that this kid is, you know, how they're being parented. Yeah. And then they can predict how this kid is going to turn out 18 years later, yeah. or, you know, as an adult leader. Yeah. It's wild stuff and it's incredibly accurate. And granted, like, you know, when it comes to attachment theory, we always say that, you know, usually you're going to be, you're not any one particular thing, right? You're kind of a blend and a mixture and certain relationships can bring out certain sides of what we're talking about. But let's just get into this because how you parent at home does indeed matter. And that's kind of the focus of today's episode. So let's dive straight into this. We have six parenting styles and we're going to sort of describe the attachments that are created from those parenting styles. Why don't we take it from the top with number one, which would be they, the funny thing is that authoritative and authoritarian are two different they words, sound the but same. they sound so similar. Yeah. So look, number one, we're going to say is a balanced approach, a healthy approach, or what's known as an authoritative parenting style. Yeah, and basically what that means is you're balancing two things. You're providing independence to the kid. They're able to express themselves and to be who they are, but it's within a clear boundary and structure, right? So, for example, the kid has say in terms of being able to play video games or, you know, watch TV, but then the parents provide the structure. You can do this for an hour, mm -hmm. and after this hour, you need to go back and study or you need to do this, right? So there's freedom, but within a clear boundary and structure, and there's rules that they need to follow. Yes. And, um, and beatings and beatings. Exactly. Don't forget the beatings. Man. It's very, very important. That's like, <laughs> no, um, before we get a bunch of, uh, hate comments, uh, I, I like to kind of think of this authoritative or this healthy structure as like, it, it depends obviously on the, the child's age, um, you know, their level of maturity and, and, but what it is is essentially that, that balanced or structured approach where there is a level of independence given based on what's appropriate. Uh, there's also structure given based on what's appropriate. So when it comes to, let's say, the topic of punishment, because that's always a hot one, should you should you spank your child? Should you just talk to them? What do you do? Uh, I'm kind of of the standpoint of like, there is no one right answer that I think, honestly, um, Jordan Peterson put that one best when he said uh, that basically, and I'm going to paraphrase this, he said that, you know, our job as parents is to do the to use the effective but least, um, I don't want to use the word traumatic, but least, you know, <laughs> what is it, serious method of punishment that would be effective. So essentially, if talking to your child is enough, if pointing out something, 
um, is enough, then then it ends there. You don't need to spank. You don't need to put them in the corner. You don't need to do anything. But maybe that's not enough. And we got to go a step forward to like, you know, putting them in the corner, um, doing timeouts, that kind of stuff. Maybe that's not enough. Maybe for some children, we have to actually spank. Um, and there's a difference between that versus, you know, abuse and whatnot. But for each child, it's different. And I'm, I'm very much of the mindset that like, not only is it different for each child, but within a family, it can be different for each one. I have four kids and the way that we discipline each one of them is dramatically different because they respond in different ways. They're their own individuals. And I think the biggest distinction here is like, for example, whether you're going to talk to them, put them in the corner, the, the secure or authoritarian approach is basically the kid has a say, like they're explaining why they did what they did. Authoritative. So authoritative. I'm sorry. Authoritative. Because you, you put the beatings in my mind. So I'm sorry. Like, so authoritarian. Anyway, I know it's stupid, right? But the goal, you know, within those scenarios, like depending upon the type of structure that's being provided, the kid has a space to express their feelings. And then there's an understanding of why it's being done. So there's that mm-hmm. healthy discussion. And then the discipline's taking place. So that is the huge distinction between having a secure parenting attachment or balanced attachment style. Yeah. So now let's go into that side because this balanced approach or healthy parenting between structure and independence and this authoritative style leads to the secure attachment. And what does that mean? So secure attachments is one of the uh, four attachment four styles. Four attachment styles. And, and I'll let you define it, but basically this is like, you're going to be healthy in your, in your relationships, your friendships, your, your romances, all that is going to be. Yeah. So without even thinking about it, you're just going to be naturally drawn to healthy people. Mm -hmm. You're going to seek out long-term relationships. You're going to be communicative. You're going to be fair. You're going to understand that there's societal rules to follow, but you can be your own person at the same time. So there's this balance of who you are as a human being. You also have a good sense of confidence and identity. You understand what you value. You, even if you haven't necessarily put it into words or, or thought about it, but you have a clear kind of well sense of self. Yeah. And that sense of self is developed by the parents because they provided the structure and then you had to work and develop yourself within that, that structured range. Yeah. Okay. So that's the goal. I do want to say that the number of us that escape childhood with secure attachments is few and far between. <laughs> You're lucky. If you came in a very secure home, you, you, home, you are blessed. They yes. gave you the ultimate blessing. But most of us, you know, it, maybe there are some secure, but it was probably the other things that we're going to go into. Yeah, because, I mean, just from a statistical standpoint, you look at uh, if we were to take just a rough number of divorce and say 50 percent already. You, you've taken half the people out of potentially, I mean, you could develop a secure attachment with just one parent. Granted, it's going to be that much more difficult. And then of the remaining people that stay together, how many are happy, healthy, functioning relationships? So that's kind of where I get to the, the likelihood of getting out of your childhood with a secure attachment. I'm going to put a guess as like 10 to 20%. You're more likely than to, to, to be the other stuff. No, it's, it's totally agreed. And then the other thing is, you know, our researcher found that 80% of divorces come from attachment wounds. Mm -hmm. So it literally affects your adult intimate relationships. Yeah. Okay. Let's go into, um, the authoritarian side. So this (laughs) This is is the beating. This is the, (laughs) this is the my way or the highway approach to parenting. This is like, and we're going to separate, these sound similar. There's over-involved and then there's authoritarian. Most of the time, these are going to lead to similar attachments. We'll get into all that, but let's focus right now on the overly strict authoritarian style of parenting. Yeah. So this is where there's too much structure. It's too rigid. It's all about following rules. And then the kid has no sense of independence, right? So they have no desire to take initiative or to honor their emotions Mm -hmm. or to follow their natural instincts. And all they care about is just following rules. And then in the parent's mind, they believe that anything is punishable. They cry, they need to be punished. Mm -hmm. They're acting out, they need to be punished. They didn't follow, they didn't do the dishes, they need to be punished. And they believe that that's keeping them in line and it's helping them to become healthy. When in truth, you're taking away their independence. Well, their, their sense of self or identity gets wrapped up in not only surviving, but just whatever it takes to not be punished. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a consequence-based motivation. Yeah. The funny thing is that I think a lot of people, again, going back to like punishment, you can be authorita- authoritarian without spanking your children. 
And I don't think people realize, and this is why people have such strong opinions on how exactly you should, you know, punish a child. And the important thing is to understand is, is there any clinical evidence whatsoever on which method works the majority of times? You mean in terms of in terms of punishment, like in terms of whether, you know, oh, well, we know that 90 percent of the time timeouts work all the time. (laughs) Like, is there any clinical studies on like whether timeouts, whether speaking to or whether spanking are always the effective method? No, I mean, there's statistics that are all over the place. I mean, the the bit, the one consistent one is to at least talk to your kid Mm -hmm. and explain like that is the consistent thing to do. Um, But yeah, in terms of that kind of like spanking is better than putting them in the corner i wouldn't have that information and the other thing to factor in is culture mm-hmm. because different cultures have different approaches right and it has different outcomes and meaning so that's another factor to, to factor in as well so again going back to dr peterson the approach and punishment should be the least serious but effective method of punishment that that the least serious whatever is going to be effective and the least serious that should be where i go for punishment but the piece to that to understand is that you can be authoritarian, you can be that dictator, that that parent that doesn't allow for any, you know, flexibility or independence, without ever hitting your child. I agree. It could be yelling. Yeah. It could be stares. It could be stonewalling. Yeah. Right. It Giving could be, them the the what is it? The cold treatment. What is it? The silent treatment. The silent treatment. The cold. Yeah. Treatment. All of that. Like that. That. You know. Some people even said it before. Like one of the uh, clients that we worked with, they're like they had a very abusive home and they're like, I'd rather get hit than being yelled and abused at because the abuse lasts forever. Whereas the hitting, it was temporary. I could work through that. So totally. the emotional abuse oftentimes is way worse than the physical abuse. Totally. So authoritarian punishment can come in any format. It's basically just when the child is not doing what I tell them to, I'm going to punish them regardless. Yeah. And using that Jordan Peterson example, it's a more extreme form of punishment, Mm -hmm. which takes away your independence. Because I think Jordan Peterson is saying you want to promote independence. So you want to start at the lower levels of discipline. Correct. To maintain that independence. Correct. The lowest level of discipline that will actually produce the desired result. Exactly. And then that keeps you motivated as an individual. So this authoritarian approach leads to the anxious ambivalent um, attachment style, which is, again, one of these four. And uh, I mean, I would describe that as basically a tremendous amount of insecurity within your relationships. Like as an adult, you're constantly fearing in your friendships, am I doing enough? Is this person going to walk away? You become the Mm -hmm. people pleaser because you're always looking to get approval. Yeah. And your whole worth is based off of what other people think of you versus what you think of yourself. Yeah. In fact, your, your security in the relationship is dependent on the last interaction that you had in that relationship. Yeah, and and you believe that all relationships are conditional. Mm -hmm. It's based on every single circumstance that takes place, so there's no security whatsoever. So you take that not only into your friendships, but into your workplace relationships, into your romantic relationships, and it sets you up for very unhealthy dynamics where basically you are ignoring your own needs, your own values, because you're trying to serve the other people to make sure that you're in a secure place within those relationships. Yeah, and you're basically experiencing two emotions. You're either anxious, and then when you're getting approval, there's relief. Mm -hmm. You're just going from anxiety to relief, anxiety to relief, and it's all based on what other people think of you. Now this this dynamic sets people up for, very much for like narcissistic relationships, because we won't go into it too much in this side, but uh, in this episode, but a narcissist is, is the person that is going to use the people pleaser, that's in a place where the people pleaser, you know, sees and appreciates the confidence and the independence and the, the charisma that the narcissist has. And the narcissist finds someone that will do anything they want, basically. Yeah. And it gives them permission to be as needy and as possible. Right. So yeah. it's like, oh, I need to spend 25 hours a day with you. Yeah. It's got to be not seven days a week, but eight days a week. Please tell me you love me for the thousandth time. It's not enough. I need more, 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 more. Yeah. They're always seeking validation and support. And that pleasing of the parent then gets transferred into all these adult relationships. Now, number three in terms of parenting styles would be the over-involved, the helicopter parent. The helicopter parent. And this is, they're not like rigid in the sense of like disciplining, but they're overly involved in their life and they're putting out difficulty in their way. So they're trying to make things as easy as possible for the kid. So it falls in that same vein because they're over-involved. And what that does is basically it takes motivation from the kid and then they feel like 
they start to procrastinate and they don't want to try and do things or accomplish things on their own. Yeah. Uh, there is a recent Disney movie that actually captured this very well. And our daughter loves it. Which one? Turning Red. Oh, I haven't seen that yet. I you want to watch it? that. Yeah. It's literally that. It's the the typical kind of helicopter Asian mom mentality. And she's raising this child. And this child basically gets to a place where she's a teenager and starts fighting back. Mm. Like she realizes that. Well, but for the first whole, you know, half the movie, it's basically her doing whatever mom requires because she's so fearful of, you know, going against what her mother says until she eventually stands up and they eventually get to a healthy place and whatnot. I don't want to ruin it. <laughs> it's fantastic. But my daughter, know. my youngest just calls it Pada. Oh, okay. <laughs> cause there's, she turns into a panda whenever she gets oh. angry. So if my daughter will come downstairs and be like, Pada. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, we'll turn on turning red. We've seen it like a hundred times now. I'm gonna have to watch that now. But that leads to the same attachment style. So that helicopter parenting leads to the same anxious ambivalent attachment and that insecurity of needing to please, needing to, yeah. you know, uh, your security and stability as a child is dependent on pleasing the parents that, that you need to please. And then you take it into your adult relationships doing the same thing. Yeah, I mean, like another example of that is like the cheerleader mom, right? They mm -hmm. get overly involved in their life. You gotta be the cheer. And then they hang out with her friends right and then they're calling her friends and they're going to the mall together Dude, that's and they're stuff. going to events together and they're making sure that everything is done correctly and they're so involved thinking that this is the best thing ever that's another example of that that parenting style which just leads to lack of motivation your lack of independence and you're just constantly nervous and not wanting to try anything side story i had a um do you remember that story of the girl I think I told it at some point that dated me to get to my best friend. Yes, you've told that story yeah. many. I think uh, you're. I think each time you share it, like you're you're letting wounds go, man. Am I? Am I, I think so. Am man. I still holding? I think you're it? healing, man. I think you're you're talking about in a healthier, healthier. Get space. the hell out of here! I'm, I've been fine <laughs> for a while. What are you talking about? No. Um, what I was thinking of was as soon as that relationship kicked up, her mom started calling me. Oh wow! Yeah, I never talked about that part. No. But uh, for probably like a month, her mom was calling me, and at first I was like. Well, this is interesting. And I almost like got sucked into the triangulating like aspect of it. Yeah. And then I realized like, this is really bad. And it was, it was weird because about a month into these, you know, twice a week phone calls, I just told her, I was like, you know, you should have a conversation with your daughter about this. And, and I, and that was the point where I just literally cut them off. Cause that was about the, the point where, you know, the, the story went that she told him not to get in touch with me anymore. So about a month in, I was over it. I was done. And I'm like, I don't want anything to do with them. Stop calling me. Why don't you talk to your daughter? But how weird is that? That like a grown ass woman is calling me. That was the birth of where you started coaching, man. It's also the birth that's of the, that's the evolution right there, man. My attraction to uh, older ladies. <laughs> that's gonna be another topic. <laughs> that's right? another yeah. episode. <laughs> <laughs> i'm always, so sidetracked right now i'm thinking about turning red and you dating older women that's right so now, funny man. i always joke around with you yeah. just like what if i get older i'm like in my opinion it's hotter <laughs> <laughs> so it all works that's out only hotter it all works out man okay <laughs> i hope she's not listening to this hearing me talk about this stuff i'm sure she is okay number four permissive parenting so this is the parenting style where the kid could do whatever he or she wants this is so they obnoxious. just kind of let them go um either like they're just not involved like they don't care like they just leave the kid alone or the kid could be really difficult so you're like hey johnny go do your homework f you mom i ain't doing jack man and they're like, okay johnny do whatever the hell you want we're just gonna leave you alone but the whole point is that they're just basically left to do what they want they express what they want and then the kid is in charge instead of the parents being in charge so there's too much independence there's no structure whatsoever in this dynamic. Yeah, this one is hilarious because if if you're one of those that believes that no child should ever be spanked, let me just bring you to a little a picture here. Just close your eyes and imagine this because you've all been in this situation. We've all been there. You're at a mall or some public place and uh, little Johnny's hanging out with his mom and mom's chasing him and like, Johnny, take a bite of food. And Johnny's like, no, mom, I want to play. And then Johnny goes and like hits another kid. And she's like, oh, Johnny, you're being so naughty. And the other parents like, dude, what the hell? Your son just hit my kid. And little Johnny's just walking all over mom. And mom is just like, oh, you're just, you're such a little troublemaker, little Johnny. And Johnny's like, fuck you, mom. And he's like, oh, there you go again. You're so hilarious. We've all looked at each other in that setting. 
all the people that are not involved. All the parents have looked at each other and I know exactly what the other parents are thinking. Don't lie. I know that you don't think a child should be spanked, but when you look at me, I know you're thinking someone needs to beat that Discipl- child. Discipline your kid. Someone needs to smack that Discipline child. Discipline your kid. Yes. Yeah. So there is a, uh, but yeah, anyway, that is the place that this permissive parenting kind of leads to is this place where you give, if we were going back to that balance, the structure and independence, you've given far too much of the independence and not nearly enough of the structure um, to the child. And no. the child basically. No, I agree. Like when I was a kid, like my best friend, his, his name was Jamie, he was a Caucasian kid and I had a strict Asian home and you bring up B plus you take a whipping and you don't follow rules and you, I'm getting, I'm getting shit for getting like an A minus. Right. But this, when I went to his house, he'd be like, mom, I got to see. And she's like, you could do, but fuck you, mom. I ain't doing shit. And I just remember thinking like, damn, I wish I was in a white parent's house. Like I wish I was, I want to be part of a white family. I was like, just watching. I was like, oh my God, this is incredible, man. Now, did he ever convince you to try that with your parents? Because I had one friend that convinced me oh, no. to try it with my parents. No, I knew I knew not to do that. But then I was kind of defiant anyway. I'd be like, why? I would always ask my parents why, but I would never go to that extent because I was like, this is incredible. Like I was amazed, you know, just watching him. And he would he would always like get whatever the hell he wanted. He wouldn't study. He would always call me like, hey, study later, man. And I was like, dude, do your homework, man. But he's like, no, nah, man. And then he would just get away with everything. It was incredible. You're smarter than me. See, I had one friend. I still remember his name. His name was David. I'm not going to share his last name. David. Very charismatic. Another white kid. It's always the white kids getting us in trouble, man. I don't understand this. <laughs> Let's not get racial. Okay. Um, anyway, all my friends were white because I grew up in Utah. So we're playing capture the flag. And every night my dad would come out and be like, pie, it's time to come home. This would be like eight o'clock ish. And uh, David's like, you know what you got to do? You got to stand your ground. You got to stand your ground and go tell your dad, I'm not coming in until I'm done playing. And I was like, you know what, David? You're fucking right. And I'm like, we got to put an explicit lyrics on this one. <laughs> explicit words. Um, you're, you're right, David. And I'm nine years old, 10. And I go back to my house and I'm like, I'm staying out tonight, dad. And he's like, what? And I go, that's right. No. And I'm losing my, like, cool, like my ability to like kind of sit, but I'm like, I'm not fucking coming in <laughs> nice. and my dad just looks at me and he's like okay stay out with your friends and i knew i was in deep shit like that was the moment where i like he just had this cold look and i went out and played and then i came home and i paid for it over the course of the next month and i never did that again wow what happened over the course of the next month oh it was everything was it it was uh stonewalling we got the you know just you go down i lived in my, my dad and I, I was in the basement because like I had my own room. It was kind of cool, but it was like, nope, just go to the basement, son. And just stonewalling spankings for when I didn't get my things done. It was, it was pretty gnarly, but it was like wow. one month of like, wow, man, David is full of it. <laughs> David's, David's advice. <laughs> that was bad terrible. advice, man. Okay. So anyway, this permissive parenting style leads to. Um, an attachment that is going to be basically avoidant and you might think of like narcissistic narcissistic they usually have very superficial relationships yeah difficulty dealing with conflict um they don't want to go beyond like the surface level of things and just want to keep things and they always just give like really piss poor advice like dude i'm so depressed my my wife left me to get over it, man. Just go jog it out, man. Just jog a few miles. You'll be all you right. You just need to play some games. Just you'll play some games, right? You'll be fine. You know, and then these are the people that like, you know, they're so casual about relationships. You had a two-year relationship and it ends and then, you know, you're like, man, I'm hurting so much. And they're like, oh, we had a good time, man. It was yeah. two years of, <laughs> let's just move on, man. And they, they, they just kind of move on to the next relationship. Well, that complete lack of structure basically meant that they kind of grew up taking care of themselves for the most part, right? They make their own decisions. They think of themselves. And of course, as an adult, then you just continue that that stream. Like I'm, I'm gonna think. I, I wasn't trained. I wasn't given structure. I wasn't taught to think of others. So I'm gonna continue this and and think of myself and what works for me. And and I'm not gonna get overly close to people. And and, and that's why they don't really get hurt is because they never invest that much in relationships in the first place. Mm-hmm. And then you're bringing up the point about the people pleasing and this dynamic taking place. The person not investing in relationships versus the person that over invests in relationships. And that dynamic takes place a lot. Yeah, when you look at it from like a, a childhood dynamic, 
the people pleaser was the one that wanted the independence, right? They, they lack that. And the narcissist is the one that wanted the structure and the ability to, and so they almost, they, they feed off each other's pains and they, they both see something in the other that they didn't have. And they kind of play out these wounds against each other yeah, regularly. They're playing out their wounds, but they also have the opportunity to heal, right? So the mm -hmm. narcissist, if they want to, if they want to, can be more empathic and more engaging and learn to give more because that's what the people pleaser is doing to the extreme, right? Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, you know, the people pleaser can learn to be more independent like the narcissist because they're doing it at a more extreme level. Yeah. But they can learn to become more independent as well. So, all right, let's go on to the fifth parenting style, which is kind of similar, but in a little bit of a different way. This is neglectful parenting. Um, which again leads us towards that avoidant narcissistic attachment style. But what is the difference between this versus permissive? So this one is more like, you know, they leave the kid alone. Um, they're not really punishing. They're not, they're just kind of letting them be. So then the kid learns, this is where like the kid is in, they're in, they're in their imagination a lot. Mm -hmm. Like Robin Williams, the comic talked about that. Like he was always just left alone. Yeah, He was always isolated. So he was always in his head. He was always imagining and thinking and playing, but it was hard for him to build trusting relationships yeah. as a kid or a, as an adult. So permissive is the the style that like the parent is there. They just allow their child to do whatever they want. Here, and they're just not around. Here, they're not all. around. And and so I almost feel like um, when we talk about narcissism, there, there's actually like kind of two clear distinctions of it. Uh, you've mentioned this before, like grandiose narcissism, where like it's all about me and I'm I'm amazing. I deserve it because yeah. I just I'm just the best thing on earth. Yeah, and then there's the um, vulnerable narcissist, right? Which is basically I've been so screwed over. Everyone owes me, and people need to give me back what I never got in the first place. Yeah. So if you think of permissive parenting as like the the mom or dad just chasing after the kids and letting them do whatever they want, and oh, you're so great, you're so wonderful. That to me is is likely to lead to grandiose, grandiose narcissism. narcissism. Yeah, because everything's about me. My parents have always served me. It's always been about making me happy. Whereas, like neglectful, when the the opposite side of this is like you still give too much independence. You're not there, but it's that you're not there. Not not too much independence, and I'm here. It's too much independence. I'm not here. I'm yeah. neglecting. And they're imagining a life where like yeah, I get my needs met, and this works out for me. So that's kind of where that vulnerable narcissist starts to develop yeah so i yeah. think a lot more in this you'd, you'd see the pathology of the vulnerable narcissist where it's like for them their childhood was about self-survival it was like you know i'm not the greatest thing nobody's paying attention to me i got to figure out how to make it work on my own and and you get that version of narcissistic tendencies yeah and this one is like no matter what i do or don't do no one gives a crap and no one's going to pay any attention to me whatsoever. Yeah. And again, when it comes to the relationships, you you take on that avoidant attachment style, right? You're not going to get overly involved. You're not going to get, you know, too close because getting too close to a friend or anybody that you're dating, that could mean potential hurt. So like, I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to keep distances. Yeah. You have very superficial relationships uh, once again. And then the other thing too is like, the distinction here is like, you owe me. Mm -hmm. And when it doesn't work out, you didn't fulfill what I... This, this need that was missing, you didn't fulfill it, it's time to move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's where the kind of the split in narcissism takes place. Okay, let's go on to the last one. So the last one, I don't know if it's so much of an intentional parenting style as it is just a, a situation, but basically a chaotic childhood environment. Um, and this leads to a disorganized attachment style. We're gonna talk about all this. But first, like for you, what is this chaotic environment? So it, it's basically structure, no structure, independence, dependence, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just completely chaotic. And usually there's abuse in the home. You know, oftentimes the parents have like a drug problem or they're just in really chaotic or abusive relationships and they're bringing them into the home. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes the kid ends up parenting the parents, Yeah. right? So then it goes to like, take care of me, but then follow my rules at the same time. And they're getting punished, but then they're being rewarded. And it's just this chaos, right? And then so basically what this person learns to develop is they're trying to be the parent and then they lose their sense of self and every part of themselves becomes very disorganized and scattered. Yeah. And it can be like, uh, it can be on the more extreme side, like you said, it could be a form of, uh, there could be abuse in the home, there could be drugs, there could be a lot of different things. It can also come from like just instability on the parent side. Like not only are we divorced and um, 
I'm going between two different homes or maybe I'm only in one home, but then my parent can't even keep a job. They're using me as like an emotional outlet. You know what terrifies me whenever I hear a parent say that their child is their best friend. I'm not yeah. saying in every case that it's this, but yeah. in so many cases, when I hear yeah. that, I'm like, yeah. oh. We lean on each other. I'm like, ooh. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah. That, that sets them up for that, you know, basically that chaotic structure where it could be because you're constantly moving and having to deal with mm -hmm. new environments and new situations and mom just lost her job and dad can't do this and there's abuse, there's drugs. There's, all of this creates an everyday environment where the child never knows what they have to deal with. Yeah, like a lower end disorganized, like you mentioned, would be like a military family that moves from mm -hmm. base to base, right? City to city, country to country, they're never settled. And that creates this kind of disorganized, shattered sense of self. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we're talking about that development of the, the, the self, the, the child, they're so fixated on, again, just how do I deal with each of these new environments and these new problems that come up? that they don't have the time, they don't have the energy to kind of develop for themselves, develop a sense of identity, a sense of values, a sense of, you know, uh, who they are. Yeah, so like in the other examples, it's like too much independence or no independence, structure or no structure. In this mm -hmm. one, it's all of it. There's independence, dependence, structure, no structure, and it's all just this chaotic mess. So the chaos is the norm. Yeah. So then that child ends up developing um, probably one of the more, I would say one of the more rare attachment styles, which is a disorganized attachment. A disorganized attachment. And then when they become adults, you know, they're the ones that you can call. And then there's two types. So there, there's one that you can call and you're like, oh, I have issues. Okay, I'm coming over right now. Mm -hmm. I'll be there for you. We'll be there at three in the morning. We'll figure all this out. And they're always there for you. But then their, their life is a complete mess and they're yeah. never taking care of any of their problems. Or... It's on the flip side where they're expecting everyone to rescue them mm -hmm. and take care of their problems, but then they're never addressing their problems in the first place. You either land on that, like, again, kind of that vulnerable narcissism side, or you're on the side of like, you're a project person. You're like a pro you're constantly looking for projects, whether it's, you know, in a person, a friend or in yeah. a person I'm dating, you're drawn to fixing other people's problems and avoiding the ones that you have for yourself. Agreed, right? And basically the rescuing or the the seeking is you're either going to rescue other people or you're seeking to be rescued yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what's very interesting about these dynamics is that depending on what attachment you land on, when you have a secure and a healthy uh, attachment and a sense of self, you generally are going to look for other people that are secure, or at least they present themselves that way. Maybe you make a, a wrong judgment or something, but most of the time, someone that's secure doesn't want a people pleaser. They want someone that's also confident and healthy. They're turned off by a narcissist. They, they can't realize, like, they can't see why is this disorganized person? Why, why can't they get their shit together? So a, a secure person is kind of turned off by everything other than just another secure person. But the other ones feed off of each other's pains depending on where they're at. Yeah, because they're attracted to the wounds that they're trying to resolve. Yeah. Right. So that's where it gets really dicey because people often mistake like, oh, if you're the people pleaser, I'm drawn to this narcissist. I think it's love. It really isn't love. It's a pain. You're attracted, you're attracted to a pain that was unresolved in childhood and you're seeking it out in your adult relationships. Correct. And someone that's secure isn't going to let you do that because they're going to be uncomfortable. Why are you doing all these things? You're, you're serving the relationship at a level beyond what's normal and healthy. And okay. that makes someone, if you're secure, that makes you uncomfortable. But Agreed. if you're a narcissist, you think that that's the way that it should be. And in those examples, the secure person is like, I don't want to understand any of this. Yeah. I'm just done. Like they just set boundaries or they just go away. And that's the ultimate sign of health. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So those are basically the six different pairing styles and the kind of attachments that they drop us into. And going back to something that we said earlier, you're more likely to be, well, not secure. Like if we're talking about just statistics, we're all more likely to be one of the other ones. And basically we spend, you know, when you're doing the personal work, you're spending your time moving from one of these boxes into the secure side. And it's kind of this process where you're, you're more than one thing, right? You're kind of, you could be a bit narcissistic in some relationships, a bit anxious and working towards being more secure. You can be a combination of them, but we're kind of we're left to sort of work towards healing those wounds and becoming secure. And, and that's that's a really good point. It, this doesn't mean that you're fixed and you're screwed for life. No. If you had this parenting, it just means that this is a pattern. You have this internal 
roadmap that was given to you, but you have the opportunity in your adult life to break patterns and to start developing healthy relationships. Yeah, you're kind of, it's the starting line of the race, right? You're placed, based on that childhood, you're placed on, you know, your starting line is gonna be a different place than someone else's. Um, but it's the same race and we're all kind of working to the same destination. We just, some of us are gonna have a tremendous head start over others. No, for sure. And once again, if you are born in a very secure home, you're blessed, you're lucky, and you have a great head start. Yeah. Okay. So for more on this, I would say jump into the newsletter. So the 12 week relationships newsletter, we call it the roadmap. It's weekly tips, insights delivered right to your inbox. These are handwritten, awesome messages coming directly from us. You can join on 12 I believe forward slash join the newsletter, but we'll link it up. So depending on where you're listening, you can also find the links on our social as well. The other thing I would say is that, um, well, welcome back from Japan, my friend. Thank you. Yeah. Still a little jet lag, but it was fun. Good to have you back. Thanks, man. We are uh, over halfway through our cohort, the first online group coaching cohort, which is going incredibly well. If you guys want to get in on the next one, that's also going to be announced in the newsletter as well. And uh, the last thing I was going to say is if you guys are digging the podcast on YouTube, give it a like, comment, tell us what you think, share it. If you are listening, you can hop onto iTunes. You can help us out by leaving a review uh, for 12 Week Relationships. Five-star review would be nice. Yes, that helps us out tremendously. It only takes 30 seconds of your time and uh, we greatly appreciate it. That's it for us though. Thank you so much. Hope you all enjoyed.